back with foot video number two for our urbanization unit. Uh, this one here, we're going to, taking a look at, there's actually two flip videos relevant to this, models of urban systems, so models of the way that um, cities actually develop. We talked about already cities developing a, through a period of stages. In this sense, we're going to be looking at sort of an abstract idea, so not something very specific, but a general concept of how cities develop. And more specifically, uh, actually not so much about cities as it is about services. So the essential question that we're going to look at here is why are goods and services distributed in the ways that they are? And the model or the theory we're going to use to drive that investigation is called Walter Kristaller's Central Place Theory, which was developed in the 1930s. Um, so let's go with our basic definition, then of course we'll naturally break that down. Um, Kristaller's Central Place Theory tells us that urban settlements develop as central places for goods and services. So just like the title suggests, and just like we see here, um, what a central place. In this instance, a city is, we're going to take out that word city, and we're going to insert the idea of, it, of uh, a central place being a settlement which provides one or more services for the population living around it. Makes sense. It's kind of the idea that rather than defining the city first, saying this is the city and that is not the city, central place theory gives us the idea that services are offered in central locations and in turn people will then come and develop those regions. Uh, key terms that we need to know to understand central place theory. We need to know this threshold. Uh, threshold is the minimum number of people that are needed to support a service. You would not start a Maserati dealership in a town of 10 people. That would simply not be economically feasible. You would not be able to maintain your um, your business in such a place. So with too few customers, stores just can't afford to stay in business. You need a certain you need a minimum number. You need a market in order to sell a good or service. The range is the average maximum distance people are willing to travel a good purchase a good or service. I know I haven't asked every single one of you individually, but I am willing to bet that if someone came up to you and said, hey, there's a Starbucks in Boston, do you want to come join me? You'd probably say no, because that there is a Starbucks significantly closer to you, and you are simply un unwilling to drive that far to get uh, a cup of coffee. Not that you drink coffee. It's bad for you. Um, but the, uh, and, and in contrast, if someone said to you, uh, you, can, you just got admitted to... University of Berkeley, California, or you just got admitted to Rice University in Texas, some really top tier universities, then I'm willing to bet that you would go. You have a much larger range for that good for that service of so a top tier university education than you do for which essentially is fast food. So beyond a certain distance, people just can't afford the travel costs. It's not worth your time after a while. So businesses are going to consider the threshold and the range of their good or service before they actually decide to start a, uh, to offer that service in a place. We've already learned this term, but just as a review, hinterland would be the area surrounding a service from which customers are attracted. Consider that if we're going to talk about D.C., we got the D.C. region. Our hinterland would be all of the surrounding area that's supported by um, Washington, D.C., and really our metropolitan suburbs, too. Two types of goods, and we're going to talk about goods and services in the context of range and threshold. There are low-order goods, things that are easily replenished. We're talking bread, we're talking milk, we're talking newspapers, we're talking Lysol, right? Things that you're not going to be um, particular, that are easy to obtain, so you're not particularly willing to to drive far for them. So just like it says here, low-order goods have a low range. People are really not, you're not going to go far to get a gallon of milk if there's a corner store right by you or if there's a grocery store right by you. Similarly, there's low-order services. These are very basic services. I think I've driven home at this point the grocery store example. So we'll go with the post office, right? You're not, um, you're not necessarily going to drive five towns over to go to the post office when there's one close to you. So low order goods and low order services have a low threshold and they're low range. They're inexpensive and people buy things frequently when, for low order goods. So there can be just a few people in a place, but the business is still feasible. So the example of that is that selling low order goods means that you can survive in small towns. Small businesses can survive in small towns because the, they have a low threshold. There's not many people that they need to make that, that business economically viable. In contrast, higher order goods are for the specialized items. We're talking cars, furniture, jewelry, household appliances, um, things that are expensive, and things that people don't usually buy very frequently. If you don't buy something particularly frequently, that's going to automatically increase uh, your range because you're, if you're not buying it particularly frequently and you can get a better deal, deal some somewhere else, then you're likely to take advantage of that deal and move and go farther to get that good. High order services are like specialty services. We, uh, we talked about this already, but we talked about hospitals, large shopping malls, universities, things that people are viewed as, oh, they're kind of like more scarce in their, uh, in their quantity and, what, and um, 
and consequently people are willing to go get them. So therefore there's a high order good, high order service, high threshold, and high range. What that leads to is that businesses selling higher order goods have to locate in large cities so they can serve a large population. There's a very large thresh, high threshold. You can't If you have a Maserati dealership, it's expensive to stay in business. So you need to be somewhere where there's a lot of rich people or at least a lot of people who are willing to come or in a place where a lot of people are willing to go so that you can actually uh, maintain your business. So that's range and threshold. Those are the two key components. Oopsies, wrong way of Chris Oliver's central place theory. You do not need to continue to copy this down, but this just is a simplification. The distribution of goods and services can therefore be explained by this concept of range and threshold. And those are just two visuals here. We need this number of people that live in this region, and this is how far people are willing to go to get that good. Part one of your analysis, I'm actually doing your analysis questions in two parts. This is part one. So pause here just to make sure that you're clear on uh, the difference between range and threshold and high and low. So hospital, gas station, bookstore, museum, and hairstylist, quickly analyze those um, so that you, so we can ensure that you're ready to go. Um, this is the wrong essential question, so let's actually fix that as we are um, chatting here. What this ultimately leads to, um, the distribution of goods and services based upon range and threshold, leads to what we would call an urban hierarchy. So we have varying sizes of human settlements that are ranked not by the actual size of the place, but by the, uh, the number and amount, or the amount of services offered there. So we talked already this concept of what is a city is such a nebulous idea. Central place theory tells us that urban areas, again, central places, are such, and they come in different sizes depending on how many services they offer the people who live there. We're going to start with the smallest, which would be a hamlet. Very, very few services offered here. Tiny little places. Um, the graphic over here says a farm, but I'm going to consider. Let's, let's stick with hamlet. I want to show you. I was just googling just to see what uh, would come up if I put in hamlet in the U.S. And this is a good example of what it would mean. I mean, these are extremely rare, and these are few and far between in the U.S. Oh, I'm sorry, extremely rare in the U.S. In many places of the world, it's not, but. Um, here, this is the, the title of this article was Go Here and Double the Population, the Tiniest Towns in America. This is Interior South Dakota, population 94. Um, I actually saw this here. I wanted to show this example um, where I read here. This is Bonanza, Colorado. And it says, without a single business or post office, the residents here are so far off the grid, they can't even, get a, they can't even manage to get a proper address. There's no cell phone service. And this is not the one I was thinking of, and now I'm wasting time. Anyway, some of these showed actually that they were um, products of deindustrialization, that these towns had been deindustrialized, and so sort of these, these people that are kind of sticking strong and staying in this, you know, maintaining what I would imagine would be pretty difficult lifestyles. But if you have a population, as these things say, of six and five, and you are not offering a lot of services in this region, you are pretty much maintaining uh, the status quo. So that would be a hamlet. A village, um, and we can actually put in here too, a village slash town, because it depends on, you I mean, these terminologies are relatively similar. Here you're going to have some services with, and a specialization with a hinterland. So you're going to have some central place that people come, small market, small downtown, um, and a land surrounding the, that market. Then we're going to bump up to the concept of a city. So in cities, then there's a huge range. I mean, again, this is just uh, difficult terms to nail down. But if you have a city, then you're going to have a lot more specialization. You're going to have enough people who are doing different tasks. Um, you're going to have maybe more retail. You're going to have more um, medical services, things like that. And you have a much larger hinterland. And I like this term here that we need to focus on. You're going to have greater centrality. Use that concept of central place theory. That you're gonna have that the there are more services offered in that central place, so that in turn think of it like a magnet. It's gonna have more centrality. People are gonna be coming into that center place um, either more frequently or in greater volumes of people. In the city, they're gonna have a, some sort of CBD, um, some sort of district, some sort of core region of that place. So within the actual central place itself, um, we build on that. We get up to a metropolis, and a metropolis usually contains several urbanized areas and suburbs that kind of act together as a coherent economic whole. This, this is what we want to think of when we think of the DMV. So we've got Baltimore, Washington. These, these areas are all kind of, may have the core out in Alexandria, or core in Tyson's, a core in Silver Spring or Bethesda, but we really have these all generally as a metropolitan area or metropolis. Megalopolis, there's that term again, also known as a conurbation is when we have these multiple, metropol multiple metropolitan areas that are all merging together. That's very similar to what we studied last class, or last video with the consolidated metropolitan areas. They're just all kind of merged together. 
So if you can see, um, the part of you are going to actually analyze is like a school. If you're going to go in a hierarchy. We have a hamlet first, then a village, then town, then city, then metropol then a metropol metropolitan area. Then we'd have no schools in a hamlet. You may have an elementary school in a village. You have a high school in a town, a uh, city in a college, and then we have a world-renowned university. And lunch is ending, so I'm going to have to pause this and return momentarily. <laughs>